Before getting into the Egyptian furniture proper, let's talk about their materials and methods so you have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. And that's always going to be important when understanding the aesthetic of really any culture. So when we look at Egyptian materials, we tend to think of things like wood, but of course, wood is rare in Egypt. It's going to be very problematic. In fact, most of the wood that they're going to work with has to be imported. Now you're thinking, well, how much import and how much trade can there possibly be in the ancient world? Well, by about 1200 BCE, we see a vast network of trade throughout the Mediterranean going as far as Spain, possibly as far as the northern coast of Spain and France. We see materials coming in from the Levant, which is the eastern Mediterranean here, materials coming in via Greece, coming in from Italy. So for example, they're going to get materials from uh, Lebanon and from other places as well as the Sudan and elsewhere. And these trade networks grow and develop. It's going to be the Bronze Age Greeks that are going to make a lot of this happen. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So they're trading quite a bit. The problem is the woods that they have available are not great for furniture. One of them, acacia, is a very good solid wood, but it doesn't work real well structurally. It's also the sort of thing that grows in these gnarled forms, these gnarled trees, and consequently you don't get big, long, straight logs. So they're going to develop this idea of patchwork construction, which we'll see in a minute. They also have palm trees, but oftentimes these palm trees, even though they're nice and straight, aren't really good for furniture. As you can see from this one that's been cut on the right, we see heartwood that's already split. We see a bulk of it is just leaf material. There's not much you can do with it. So it'd be very difficult to get a very broad piece of palm to work with. So what do they do? Well, using trade, they're going to get woods such as ebony, which you see on the left from Sudan, and cedar that you see on the right from Lebanon, as well as other places. These woods are going to be imported on a regular basis because obviously wood is a lot easier to work with when it comes to furniture than, for example, oh, stone or mud brick or anything along those lines. We're also going to see that they're going to be working with a very interesting climate, a climate where if the piece of furniture survives out of the Egyptian period, it usually is well preserved to us. So most of what we get is actually from tombs. And of course, the only people who can afford to be buried with furniture are going to be the upper classes and the pharaohs. So we tend to see really high-end furniture. We do see some lower-end pieces, and I'll try to highlight those as we move forward. We also have a whole number of different methods that the Egyptians are going to use. First of all, they're going to use that patchwork construction. Now, sometimes it works well. For example, this box, if you look very closely, I can start to draw out the different pieces that were used. For example, this very small piece of wood here for the base, and then we have a single frame piece here uh, around the corner. This piece in the middle, this is probably a small panel that moves across, maybe made up of multiple pieces. But again, you see that throughout the construction that we see a lot of small pieces rather than one solid piece being carved. That's because they can't get large pieces of wood. They would be very expensive. They're going to be imported, so we don't see it that often. And if you see it in construction, you know it's a high-end piece in ancient Egypt. They also use a number of different joinery techniques, including, for example, the butt joint, where you simply glue two pieces of wood together. We see flat tongues and dowel joints, something along those lines. We will see uh, the use of pegs. We will see scarf joints, where two ends of wood are put together. We will see tongue and groove. Uh, dowels are regularly used. So they're using a lot of different methods, not all of these methods, because some of these will be developed later on. The most simple form that we see in 
Egyptian construction is actually lashing, and this is a form that is really simple to work with. You create, for example, a tongue and groove joint, and then we drill a few holes and lash leather throngs through it. This is how everyone from the Inuit building their kayaks to uh, some modern day furniture is put together. It's very, very simple. And you use it when metal is going to be scarce or just very, very expensive. For them, especially when you're in the Old Kingdom, this is the Bronze Age. This is before iron is commonly available and bronze and copper nails don't hold very well. So it's easier to use either glues or some form of lashing. We also see the use of inlay, which is taking a piece of another material and laying it into the original material. Here we see an illustration. And so you're carving out a piece and then you're putting a piece that perfectly fits that carve out into place. And you can get very ornate with that. Here we see uh, the white is ivory and we see black, which is probably ebony and other materials being used to create this inlay. You don't use this for common functional materials or common functional pieces. You would, however, use it for the upper class, religious pieces, or the pharaoh. They also will upholster pieces. I understand this is not Egyptian. This is the closest I could get. Obviously, we don't have a lot of Egyptian upholstery. Upholstery is nothing more than filling some piece of fabric with something soft and sitting on it. So they're going to use those techniques, but again, upholstery is something that you're going to see most commonly in the upper classes, not something that you're going to see amongst the poor. And amongst the poor, the seating would have been highly limited. It would have been very low stools. Tables would have existed, but only for very utilitarian purposes. They're not sitting down around a dining room table. Frequently, they would sit or squat on the floor, as we see in so many Egyptian illustrations. Some of the furniture may have also been made of mud brick. Now you're saying, why would you make a table or something out of mud brick? But they didn't. Imagine that I have a wall, for example, and I'm going to take that wall here and here's my floor and I need a bed. So I may use mud brick to simply build a platform on which to sleep or a small bench or something along those lines. Of course, that furniture wouldn't have survived to this day. And we don't really consider it furniture in the modern world, but it really is because it's going to serve those purposes. Now, the most common pieces that we tend to see are small tables and stools. We're going to see those in the upper classes as well as in the lower classes. And the stools tend to take on a very simple form. They're very utilitarian. The tables, same thing. Four legs, stringers. And in this case, note the patchwork top. The, these are boards that are glued together. They're not even straight boards frequently as in, in this case. Uh, they're just sort of patched together with what they have. Again, they don't have those massive pieces of wood that we might have, for example, in the modern United States today. <laughs> 